Welcome to the 23rd annual Danilo Hussarstrup Memorial Lecture. The lecture is sponsored by the Danilo Hussarstrup Program in Ukrainian Literature, which is a part of the Canadian Institute of Ukrainian Studies, which is in itself a part of the University of Alberta all of which doesn't make sense if I'm running this show from the University of Toronto, <laughs> here in Toronto, but there, there are easier things to understand than academic structure, and I will leave that question for sharper minds to delineate. The program was founded 24 years ago now, after the sudden and unexpected death of Danilo Hussarstruk, who was a professor of Ukrainian literature at the University of Toronto. The uh, program, of course, was created to honor his memory and in particular to honor his abiding attachment to Ukrainian literature. In the course of his career, Danilo Struk accomplished a great many things. He is perhaps best known for his work as editor of the English Language Encyclopedia of Ukraine, but his lifelong commitment was to Ukrainian literature, and he was a devoted student of Ukrainian literature, also a very devoted and skilled teacher of Ukrainian literature and in the course of his career, he influenced a great many students, many of whom show up at my doorstep and are pleased to tell me what an influence he had on them. The program conducts a number of activities, of which perhaps the most prominent is this lecture series, which has been going on since uh, the program was created it, literally shortly after the decisions were made shortly after he passed away. And so within a year, we had the first lecture. If your math is good, then you will notice that we've actually lost a year somewhere. That was 1920 at the beginning of the pandemic when we weren't sure whether to schedule a lecture or in person or online. And Things got confused and in the end there was no lecture. So we're one year behind in our lectures, but nevertheless, we've been continuing them uh, faithfully from the start. And if you visit our webpage, which I hope you shall, you will find uh, audio and in some cases video record of the various lectures that have uh, transpired. And we are very proud of that accomplishment we've had some of the finest lectures in Ukrainian literature from around the world. The one caveat being that the lecture, as we established it, is conducted in English. And therefore, uh, th there are perhaps some Ukrainian candidates who are excluded for want of ability in English. We also are involved in uh, translating Ukrainian literature, and we hope to be entering that field a little more forcefully in the coming year. We have in the past, when the COVID situation was different and when there was no war in Ukraine, uh, sponsored trips and uh, appearances by various Ukrainian writers and Ukrainian literary scholars here in Canada, not just in Toronto, but throughout Canada. All of this is made fame, is made possible by the generosity primarily of uh, Danilo Struk's family, but also of his many friends. And we are grateful to them for funding this program that allows us to uh, proceed with our activities. Today's lecture, I must apologize, was meant to be in person. However, once again, <laughs> events transpired to make that difficult for us. 
the various uh, arrangements necessary to make this possible ran aground on on the banks of a public service strike in Canada which meant that the possibility of our speaker getting a visa in time to to know with certainty that she will appear here in Toronto was uh, disrupted and so we switched to the Zoom format uh, <clears throat> we are in a regular Zoom meeting format which means if i may explain to everyone that i must ask you to keep your microphones muted with the exception of the speaker of course so that we don't interfere with the speaker's lecture we will have a question and answer period of course at the end at which point i will invite you to unmute yourself and to pose your questions unmute and and unmute your uh, uh, video as well so that we can see who's asking the questions next year we will reach the 25th just short of the 25th anniversary of Danilo's death and uh, we ho hopefully will be undisturbed in planning more in-person events and a larger event to uh, commemorate that day but let me turn to uh, today's lecture and today's speaker we are delighted uh, to have with us Professor Olena Haleta. Uh, Professor Haleta, like many of our colleagues in Ukraine, is a highly productive and, and hardworking scholar with a great deal to show for her activity. She is the Professor of Literary Theory and Comparative Literature at Ivan Franko National University in Lviv. She is also a Professor of Cultural Anthropology Harvard University, where she has spent, as I understand it, this last semester. That is something that she has done a great deal of, that is to uh, lecture and uh, teach at other places. She has been uh, the professor and researcher at various places, starting with Zagreb and Charles University in Prague, the Humboldt University in Berlin, the Jagiellonian Warsaw, and, and as I said today uh, in Harvard. Her uh, professional activity, her publication activity is uh, very wide ranging. She has published a large number of uh, books and articles. Many of them were compilations. That is, she is a prolific uh, worker in the field of producing edited volumes of important materials. It's, some of these materials are of a pedagogical nature. She is also involved in translation. That is, she is uh, a toiler in the field of Ukrainian literature in Ukraine, producing materials for other scholars, for students, but also uh, her own original literary scholarship. I, I probably first uh, she probably first came to my prominence in connection with her work on Valerian Pitmoheni, someone I had done work on previously, and so I took note of the fact that uh, she had published an edited volume of essays about uh, Pitmoheni. But I was very happy to actually be present at the launch of uh, her uh, most important monograph, the, uh, uh, at that point still a manuscript that we were examining at the uh, Faculty of Comparative Literature at the View University where I had been invited to spend a few weeks in, in their meetings and we I had the opportunity to read and to uh, evaluate with others uh, her uh, monograph on from anthology to ontology, a, a study of anthologies in, in Ukrainian literature, and, and not but, not only uh, Ukrainian. It, it is a fascinating aspect of her scholarly work that she is both a very diligent scholar in traditional fields, 
like, for example, Valerian Pitmoheny or the, the Ukrainian poets in, of the New York group and so on, work that she has done in the past. But she is also a scholar who expands the horizons of literary scholarship in Ukraine and her uh, work on anthologies is testimony to that. I, I could keep on talking that is if if you want to look up her CV online, you'll discover that it is very, very, very lengthy and there's much to talk about there. But without further ado, let me turn the speaker, the microphone over to uh, Professor Haleta and she will talk to us on a very interesting subject, a subject I suspect not not only I knew very little about, but many of us know very little about, that is Sofia Yablonska's to be with the other Sofia Yablonska's travelogues as modernist auto-narrative. Professor Haleta, the microphone is yours. <clears throat> Thank you so much. Dear colleagues, it's a big honor for me to participate in this series of lecture in memoriam of Danilo Husser Struk. And I'm delighted to be invited and to be introduced by Professor Maxim Tarnowski. I have never had a chance to meet uh, Professor Struk in person, but participating in this series of lecture, I feel myself like becoming member of academic community, which is not limited in space and it's not limited in time. So that is not occasionally that I decided to propose for today lecture my research dedicated to Sofia Yablonska, because as for me, she was also not limited in space. She traveled a lot and she have lived for a long time, sometimes for decades in different countries, in different parts of the world. And she's not limited in time because uh, she published her travelogues about 100 years ago, but they are still interesting, inspiring, and I would say thought provoking. So thank you for introducing my title to be with the other and to be the other, Sofia Abloinska's travelogues as modernist after narrative. I have to say also that I will use in my presentation photos taken by Sofia Yablonska in different parts of the world. And uh, I'm very grateful to Natalie Uden, who is Sofia Yablonska's granddaughter and who is also an owner of personal Sofia Yablonska archive. I had a chance during the last summer, I had a chance to be invited to Paris and to spend about one week working with this materials, classifying and reading many of texts written by Sofia Blonska for the first time. So I think that that is also a reason to introduce Sofia Yablonska herself and to say several words about her biography, because it's also helped us to understand general circumstances of her writing. She was born 1907 in, uh, so in, in village Hermaniv. It is placed near Lviv in Galicia, and at that time it was a part of Austrian-Hungarian Empire. And she traveled for the first time when, when he was a child, and it was not her decision. She was forced to leave her home in time of the First World War. That is also a family story, because her father, who was a Greek Catholic priest, he was influenced by Russian propaganda before and in time of the First World War. And he decided that to be that is the only chance for Slavic, different Slavic nationalities uh, to be developed, just keeping together with um, other East Slavic, East Slavic nationalities. He support the idea of Islamic unity. And that is why she decided to move from Galicia to territory of Russian Empire after Galicia was occupied by Russian forces and after that these forces moved to the east. But he realized very quickly that it was completely wrong decision because uh, the whole family spent several years on the territories which belonged to Russia at that time and it was a really hard time to survive. 
Several years after, they managed to cross, it was not officially, but they crossed Russian Polish, Soviet Polish border, and they returned to Lviv region. And Sofia Yablonska had this one experience of traveling. What was once again not her decision, and it was, and it was not very happy experience, not happy at all. And she reflected it being um, much more older. And she said that she decided to organize her life in a way that she would never be pushed to leave her home. So after returning to Galicia, Alicia, Sofia Jablonska uh, continued her education, and that is also important to remember that she has never been educated in Ukrainian language, because she started her education in Russia, in Russian language, and then continued it in Lviv, but Lviv at that time became a part of the Second Polish Republic, so she continued her education in Polish language. She was especially interested in, uh, interested in theater, and she participated in courses which prepare to the stage, act, and she, she would like to be prepared as an actress. But she also uh, graduated for commercial courses organized by Commercial Academia in Lviv for women. She was quite successful in this sphere because she started to manage to cinemas to earn money and to realize her life dream. But her dream was to travel to Paris and to continue her education. She was fascinated by cinema and she decided to become a professional actress. And in 1929, being 22 years old, she started her travel, uh, sorry, it's not 29, it, in the end of 1926, beginning of 1927, so she was only 20 years old, and she started her travel to Paris. In Paris, once again, she faced a problem of cost for living, and she uh, communicated with French artists, and she became a model for French artists, uh, and she spent sometimes living in one of studio. It's like common place for young people who were interested in art and who, who not only painted, but also, also tried to write literary text. Uh, being 22 in uh, 1929, Sofia Jablonska traveled to Morocco, and she spent several months in Morocco, mostly in Marrakesh, but not only in this city. And after that, she decided also to describe her traveling experience. As we know, she tried to write in French language, but as for today, it was only known from uh, Volodymyr Venichenko's diary. Because um, Sofia Jablonska met Vinnychenko in Paris, and they have stayed in contact for a long time. She visited Vinnychenko from time to time, and when she traveled, she also, um, she also sent letters to Vinnychenko, and Vinnychenko answered, and that is how we could discover something about Vinnychenko and also about Sofia Jablonska life. Uh, so, um, after returning from Morocco, she started, as I said, to write about her travel, but after the first attempt to write something to, uh, in, uh, in English, because, uh, sorry, in French, it was, uh, as for now, it was not especially clear what kind of text she decided to write in French language. But what we know, she switched to Ukrainian language and she started to write in Ukrainian. And that was how she wrote her first travelogue under the title, uh, uh, The Charm of Morocco. This text was published in Ukrainian language uh, in Eastern Galicia. And previously, uh, this one text was published in fragments in Ukrainian periodicals. Uh, in time when the book about Morocco was published, Sofia Jablonska started her next trip, and that was her trip to China. That was how she started to travel around the world. That was her main dream. But once again, it was not so easy to organize it, and she decided to earn some money for this trip um, working for a French uh, cinema company. 
It was a company which was interested in reports from territories which were, were at that time under French control in different parts of the world. So she signed a contract, two-year-long contract, and decided to go to China to work, to earn money, and then realize her dream. Exactly two years later, 1934, she left French controlled territories in China. She traveled to other provinces of China. And after that, she traveled also to other countries. She spent more than a year traveling around the world and living in different places. After that, she returned to China because before she started her uh, round the world trip, she also married a Frenchman who was a commercial um, and they lived in China and they uh, they lived and like uh, they they returned to Europe to Paris only in 1946. So after the Second World War, Sofia Jablonska wrote her travelogue in thirties, and the first one, as I said, was published in 1932. The second one, 1936, and the last one, travelogue, was published in 1939. You can see here on this slide also her road, how she traveled and what places she visited traveling around the world. But I would like to switch to the next slide. Yes, and to demonstrate the time and the titles of books she published. As I said, the third travelogue in two volumes was published under the title Distant Horizon in 1939. Two more books were published after Sofia Blonska died in 1971 in car accident. So uh, in 1972 was published a book which contained her short stories under the title Two Skills, Two Measures. And five years uh, after that was published another one book, and that was a book of memories, a book about my father from my childhood. All of these books were published in Ukrainian language, but as I discovered working with Sofia Blonska archive, she decided to write the last book in French language, and this book was dedicated to her son, who were not able to read in Ukrainian. But she tried to say to them something that was very important for her, for understanding how she defined herself and how she defined the community she also represents. What is interesting and what intrigued me when I discovered for myself Sofia Yavlonska travelogue, that was that they almost fully disappeared from a history of Ukrainian literature. From the very beginning of 90s, some publication, publication, academic publication dedicated to Sofia Blonska Travelogue started to appear in Ukrainian academic periodicals. And each publication uh, evoked a kind of wow reaction. Wow, we have something unexpected in Ukrainian literature of interwar period. We have travelogues describing different kinds of traveling experiences. But at the same time, we almost overlook such a phenomenon in the history of our literature. But what is also interesting, that each time after such kind of reaction, this travelogue once again and once again disappeared from the literary history. We could ask ourselves why it is possible that something like that is happening. Maybe because travelogue were, um, for, for a long time have, haven't been defined and accepted as a part of literary creativity. But nevertheless, in 2015, Vasily Habor decided to republish all the three travelogues in one book. In the same year, uh, her um, a book about my father from my childhood was also republished in Ukraine in Ukrainian language. So the first publication, which appeared in Edmonton, so it was like an edition prepared in Paris and Edmonton, was also published in Ukrainian language. And that was the decision uh, which took Marta Kalitovska, who was a secretary of Sofia Yablonska, and who decided to collect and to publish unpublished Sofia Yablonska works after her death. Uh, a bit later, some other books also appeared. Vasily 
Gabor published another one book, um, and in uh, the second edition, he decided to publish, not to republish travel of itself, but to collect all of the fragments, how they appeared in the first journal publications. That is very interesting from literary point of view, because we can also compare it to two versions of text. Sometimes they are a bit different. And he also collect all of literary review and interview with Sofia Bloinska as published in 1930s. Uh, I would also mention another one publication that is an album. You can see it also uh, on the screen between uh, a book about my father and another one album, Teura Sofia Jablonska. And um, this one edition contains only photos taken by Jablonska. And the last one, so I mean um, the cover which is placed on the right side of my slide under the title Teura, that was a name. Um, which started to, uh, which Yavlonska started to use. So she was given this name when traveling on Bora Bora on other islands. And she spent uh, quite a lot of time living on these islands. So she also had a new name for herself to be accepted as a part of local community. So the last one book is extremely important because um, in this book is included also a new information or newly discovered information, which was found uh, by uh, Veronika Homenyuk and Andrei Benetsky, two young scholars from Lviv, at that time really young scholars, because they were amazed students in time they started to be interested in Sofia Jablonska writing. And they were the first people who visited Natalie Oden and, and uh, who published something from Sofia Jablonska archive. But we still have a lot of the materials to be read and to be published and also to be analyzed. And Rodovit Publishing House, which uh, published Teura, also republished all of three Yablonska travelogues. So as for now, Sofia Yablonska is quite known in Ukrainian literature, but we still have a lot of questions to answer when reading and discussing her work. Uh, just to conclude this my part about uh, edition and re-edition of Sofia Jablonska books, I would like also to present these two uh, publications, these two books, and their translation to German language of Sofia Jablonska first and the second travelogue. And I was delighted also to prepare afterwards to the first and the second of edition, and the second book was also introduced by Yuri Andruhovich. So I really believe that texts written by Sofia Jablonska about 100 years ago are still interesting, not only for Ukrainian readers, but they represent also Europe from a bit unexpected and very often overlooked perspective. Not only Europe, but also the Western tradition. And I will pay attention to this question, how Sofia Jablonska identified herself, starting with national identification and then changing the level of identification and accepting and representing herself as a person who represents, who belong to Western cultural tradition. But I would like to say several words about my methodological approach. I would describe my way of reading of Sofia Jablonska travelogue as literary anthropology. This term was introduced for the first time, I mean, not from the side of cultural anthropology, but from the side of literary theory, literary studies by Wolfgang Ezer at the beginning of 90s of the 20th century. And as for Ezer, literary anthropology understood literature as a mechanism for the creation of new senses and new meanings, as well as new forms. And literature from this perspective is one of the attributes of the human being. So for him, literature is very specific cultural practice, I would say, because literature is highly individualized a uh, highly individualized expression, which is accepted by community as a common experience. In the process of reading, in the process of critical uh, reviewing what, what is read, what, what is written, yes, we also accept different kinds of experience. And that is also an experience of articulation of our life experience as, oven, as something we have in common.
Literary anthropology was also characterized by Clifford Geertz, who said that liturgy, literary anthropology um, allowed us to understand liturgy as a specific type of transgressive thinking, a periculous business that not only describes reality and creates its own, but also changes the author and the reader in the process of writing and reading. I would also citate two German authors who um, underlined three aspects of uh, literature as seen from the perspective of literary anthropology. Uh, according to them, liturgy accumulates previous human experience and uses it to ensure further human development. Articulate this experience implementing the aesthetic function of language. And finally, show and simultaneously forms the place of the human in the world. So when talking about Sofia Blonska writing, it's exactly about the new experience, not only for her personally, but also for Ukrainian culture, for Ukrainian literary tradition. And that is important how this experience is articulated and accepted. Because to articulate a new experience is also a chance to rethink our own identification. And I would conclude this part with several more citations from the recently published research. Nigel Rapport, who tried to redefine literary anthropology from the perspective of the 21st century, said that literary anthropology could be understood as an exploration of the role that literature plays in social life and individual experience, in particular social, cultural, and historical settings. Included in this study is the question of what literature is. That is why reading of Sofia Vlaska Travelogue also uh, inspire us to rethink the very idea of literature in Ukrainian context, but not only in Ukrainian context. And um, according to another author, literary anthropology seeks to discover different genres of expression and how these genres can be said to have historical specificity, a cultural evaluation, and a social institution attached to them. And the last definition of literary anthropology, it could be understood as a study of cultural, creative, and productive practices in the field of literature. That is once again why it is so important to consider travelogues as a part of Ukrainian liturgy of 20s and to reread the whole configuration of Ukrainian liturgy of that time. Just to summarize my methodological section, I would say that literary anthropology allows us to understand literature as a specific cultural activity aimed at collective and personal cultural identification. Now I'm going back to Sofia Jablonska. When to characterize the general circumstances of her life and of her writing, I would like to remember once again, that was really complicated time. That was a time of the great changes and even historical and political catastrophe. As I said, as I mentioned, when we start to reread, I mean, the reading community in Ukraine, Sofia Blonska writing, it was wow effect. It was also accepted as a kind of adventure writing. But once again, this text appeared in very specific circumstances. From one time, we have the First World War, the Second World War, turbulence on political level, economic level, historical level. And at the same time, that was a time when the independence of Ukraine and integrity of Ukraine was declared officially on political level for the first time. Uh, I just mentioned that Sofia Yablonska had her own traumatic experience, traumatic experience of traveling because she was forced to leave her home and she decided to build her life in such a way that she would never become an exile. Her writing are, um, <clears throat> Her writing demonstrates the very process of looking for a proper language to express herself and also to express the culture, cultural identity which she represents. 
That means that we could identify different kinds of stereotypes and prejudice of the imperial perspective, because she was a person who represent tradition of writing, tradition of thinking. And at that time, we know that many of, so each time different texts written in this or in other one circumstances are limited by historical features. Sofia Jablonska, who started to write uh, or, or who, who started to be educated, professionally educated in French language, who started to travel working for French company, who used French language to communicate with people in different parts of the world, which were under French control, she was accepted as a person who represent imperial perspective. At the same time as Ukrainian, she was a person who represents some utopian dreams of a state-like nation. That is why her perspective and her writing is, in some sense, even unique. And I would like to pay our attention also to language levitation and a lack of professional education, because Sofia Jablonska did not use like uh, some, how to say, professional models to describe her experience. For her, it was an experience she tried to describe in a language she has never learned. I mean, Ukrainian language, yes, but she was limited by her home experience. And she was looking for, con consciously looking for the best way how to use language to express her feeling, emotion, thoughts, and so on. So now I would like to go to her archive and to demonstrate some documents and how we could be benefited from reading Sofia Jablonska travelogue in the context of her personal archive. This archive contains different kinds of documents. It's personal documentation. It's also a different kind of private and not only private correspondence and saying about private, I mean, in uh, correspondence with family members, but she also stayed in contact with Ukrainian, not only Ukrainian writers, painters, publishers, editors. Uh, we could discover some, some biographical data, reading different kind of documents. Yes, we could rebuild Sofia Yavlonska trajectory. But what is even much more interesting, as I mentioned, that is her correspondence with different writers, with different cultural figures. I just demonstrate several of such letters, and these letters are written by Volodymyr Vanichenko, by Mikhailo Rudnitsky, by Lydia Buryachinska, by Olena Kisilevska, by Stefania Chizhovich, by also Roman, uh, Roman uh, Turin, for example. So there are just a few people who stay in contact with Sofia Jablonska. And reading this letter, we could discover for our Yourself, a kind of virtual literary community, and also to analyze what other readers, professional readers, non-professional readers, expected from Sofia Blonska, how she was affected, how she was influenced, influenced by this expectation, and what exactly she was trying to say to her reading public. Uh, <clears throat> But what was completely undiscovered in the history of Ukrainian literature, that were contacts of Sofia Blonska with French painters who belonged to a group which called himself themselves uh, painters of real poetic. Among people who belonged to this one group were such painters and writers as Christian Kalyar, Beatrice Apia, Jean Dabi, and Rand Champigny. What I discovered reading this part of Sofia Blonska archive, but I have to say that unfortunately I do not speak and read in French language. And the only way to discover the context of these letters was to read it uh, with Natalie Udan together. And I translated to Natalie from Ukrainian to English, and Natalie translated from French to English the letters which were the most interesting for both of us. But what is interesting and what is saying, what, what they are saying, these letters, I mean, to us as contemporary readers. 
First of all, we could discover that the idea to travel to Morocco was not so original in case of Yablonska. It was rather a typical road for French artists from young generation of French artists at the beginning and in middle of the 20th of the 20th century. I just said that uh, Morocco or a part of Morocco was under French control. And to travel to Morocco, it was com comparatively cheap. To live in Morocco for several months it was also comparatively cheap. And that was a way to discover for themselves something that could not be defined only as European on Western experience. So almost all of these artists whose name I mentioned also traveled in 20s to Morocco. But Sofia Jablonska did not join them. They decided to go alone. And we could see in what context this one experience was discussed. You can see here a picture created by Irene Champigny. And that is Sofia Jablonska, who is looking for adventure, who is ready to take risks, who is doing something for fun in Morocco. And that was a general expectation, not only from French, but also from Ukrainian side, when she started to discuss, to describe her own experience of traveling to Morocco. But I would like to pay your attention also to another one figure who was Christian Kalyark. He was not only friend, but they were in very uh, close relationship with Sofia Jablonska. But nevertheless, um, this story was without ending and without continuing because um, Christian Kalyark decided to start another one travel. And Sofia Jablonska, who was like, um, has very strong feeling to Christian Kalyark, she, she did not marry him. Yes. Uh, but once again, she was influenced by like um, cultural models as um, created and as developed by this uh, this young people, this young painters and uh, young writers. What they started to practice, as I said, not only to paint, but also to write text to describe their experiences. And Sofia Blonska also started to note what she experienced. And after returning from Morocco, she decided to write a text. What we know from Volodymyr Vinnychenko diary, she started to write in French language. That was the only one evidence, the only one information about writing in France, in French language. Uh, but what I discovered in Sofia Jablonska archive, that is this one notebook, that is not a draft of a literary text, but this diary, con um, this diary includes at least one fragment which could be identif uh, identified as a part of Sofia Jablonska novel she tried to write in French language. So how it was possible to identify this text? I found the name of Ivanka, Ukrainian name, in this text. And I remember that Vinnychenko mentioned this name once in, in his own diary. And he mentioned this, this name as a name of the main character of Sofia Blonska novel she started to write in French language. As we identified with Natalie, it's exactly a fragment which should be included into her novel. And what was the most interesting in this fragment? She was also looking for a title for this novel. And she had three versions, Black Flower, Black Star, and Monster. It, so it says uh, something to us as readers. Yes, we could see, we could identify this one text or rather idea of this text as a bit, rom a big, uh, as a bit romantic idea. And um, what is also interesting to know that Jablonska started to write, and she started to write, she decided to create a main character of her text, um, which was very close to herself biographically. I mean that the main character, it was also a woman, it was a young woman, and she was traveling. And she tried to express, or Jablonska tried, uh, tried to describe this one experience of her character. But that is the only one fragment which was discovered, and this text at least has never been published. I'm not sure that this text was 
finish it. Maybe she only tried, but finally she decided that that this one, this one attack, uh, attempt will be not successful. What we know, we can compare Sofia Blonde's experience to experience of other people who belong to the group of painters I just mentioned, and even the most successful of them spent several years trying to publish the first novel and only being supported by uh, well-recognized French authors, they managed successfully publish their text. So Sophia Yablonska changed the way of writing, not only language of writing, but also the way of writing. As, as I said, she decided to start to write Ukrainian, and she changed the form of her writing, and she started to publish fragments which were included in the book under the title The Charm of Morocco. And this choice was really remarkable. Uh, it looks especially interesting in the context, in a general context, not only literary context of that time. Because uh, switching from uh, a form of novel to the form of travelogue, Sofia Yablonska also allowed herself to create a narrative which was autobiographical and also in some sense anthropological because she expressed her own experience she expressed it from the like from 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 his own perspective and she she described her own in this one text she represent herself not created a literary character and she also reflect her experience how um so her experience of traveling and her experience of discovering of different cultural tradition different cultural circumstances when we are talking about the first half of the 20th century, we could also remember that that was a time when anthropological and autobiographical writings became especially popular. Sofia Blonska was not an anthropologist. She was not educated as an anthropologist. So in some sense, it's even interesting because she was not following some forms of writings. I just would like to remember that that was a time when um, Claude Lévi-Strauss, one of the most famous French anthropologists, also traveled. He traveled to uh, South America. And it was exactly the time Sofia Blanska traveled to Morocco and then to China. And Claude Lévi-Strauss published a number of books. But the first book in which he also decided to include and represent his subjective experience was published only in 1955. That was The Sad Tropics. And only in 1988, um, Clifford Geertz, American anthropologist, wrote a book and dedicated one of chapter to uh, exactly this one publication, but Claude Lévi-Strauss, and declared that this one, not structural anthropology, but exactly this one is the most important to understand uh, the whole system, anthropological system, as developed by Claude Lévi-Strauss. I just would like also to mention that that was a time when not only men but also women started to travel and started to write professional and non-professional anthropological texts, anthropological narratives. Uh, I could mention here Ruth Manedick and Margaret Mead, but once again, Sofia Ablonska wasn't an anthropologist, but she was an author who started to develop her own subject, uh, subjective and individually oriented uh, narrative. She started with the idea to map not only internal, but also her own external experience. And she started to create the documentary narration as a recording of new impression. Uh, but from the first travel, she also reflected her own identity. If we are facing different cultural experience, we are also forced to redefine ourselves. We could observe how from the first publication, Sofia Yablonska also reflected her national, her national identity. But um, for her, it is especially important because to um, 
say something about her nationality, it also means rather to complicate a situation, not to explain, not to clarify, but complicate. Because it was not so easy to explain who are Ukrainians and where exactly they are placed on a map at the first half of the 20th century. Uh, one of the most seeing the, or most remarkable fragment, and she reflects her national identity. Uh, you can see on the screen. I started explaining him. So she is, uh, she is uh, talking with um, Arabic man from Morocco, Arab man, Said, and she tried to explain who she is and why she couldn't be described and um, identified as Russian woman. I started explaining him the difference between us and the Russians. Draw a map of Ukraine and its neighbor countries so that he better understood its location. Eventually, I told that there are around 40 million of us and that Ukraine was one and a half times bigger than France. All this explanation I know better than a prior, because I have often to repeat them to French and other strangers who know nothing about our existence. But once again, I would like to, uh, to say that that is the only first step in, uh, of self-identification and self-description. What is interesting in this text, that is how Sofia Blonska reflect other culture. She, uh, so her narrative is really highly emotional. And she starts with descri describing and representing her own emotional and psychological con con condition. My astonishment from the first impression was limitless. So what we have in this one sentence, it's from the very beginning of the whole narrative about Morocco. That is nothing about Morocco. Everything is only about Sofia Yablonska, only about a person who found herself in a new situation, in a new circumstances, and who experienced something extremely intensive. So how she described the beginning of her travel, the train said, set out to the sun to the blue sky at the midday, to fufu, to fufu at the midday, the jolly uh, beating of my heart merged with the gay noise of iron bells. So how she built, how she started to build her narrative, uh, a lot of emotions and even some words without meaning, just sounds, to fufu, to fufu. So she tried to imitate the voice and to imitate also uh, represent or ref reflect, no, maybe even not reflect, yes, but uh, create an effect in her own text, an effect of the rhythm of the, of the train. The wind brings mixed smell of flowers, vegetables, candles, lamp, and honey. Being drunk with the smells, sounds of monotonous music and uh, chirping of birds, covered with the blue sky, I will draw for you the majestic beauty of Marrakesh and life of the Arabs. Once again, about feeling how she experienced the world, and that is about different kind of perception and about her own condition. And she is like very, very emotional. Yes, this emotions are very, very intensive. Another one example. Drunk with the impression, strong smell of sweetie bodies, baked lamb, candles, oranges, screaming, dancing, the mirror and Arabic music. I came back from the Arabic amusement square. My hat is going wrong at the will of the toy windmill. That is also interesting. The same strategy. So I can only citate some fragments from the text. But what is interesting, she starts with describing her condition. And only after that, she starts to describe the situation, to describe the experience, what exactly caused this one emotional and psychological condition.
So when to reflect the genre of travelogue and to compare it to the novel, I have to say that novel is like completed story. Yes, we know the end of this one story. But when we are writing a travelogue, especially if travelogue is written in a process of traveling, so the only one principle of organization is chronological one. Yes, we experience something and we start to, 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 to um, describe this one experience. Yes, to articulate articulate this one experience. And then we have different parts of the story which are following each other in chronological order. So on the general level, Sofia Yablonska writing is organized in chronological level. But on the micro level, is completely different because once again that's about condition and only after that about the situation which causes this one condition. So another kind of writing we could observe when she is going directly to describe it, what is seen, what is experienced. And she's especially attentive also to body language and she accepts what's going on as a kind of performance. So how she described barbarian fabulous in the Arabic city. He drew attention of the spectators with nothing else but his articulatory mimics and body movements. Many Arabs in the crowd were not able to understand the Berber language. He did not make any odd movement. Each one was a logical, smooth accompaniment to his words. This was a perfect plastic dance. He was breaking the line of his movements or making an ascent with the rise of his voice, face expression, meaning of his words. He was playing with awesome all muscles of his body, fingers, finger knees. He even was using the ear breath out and he makes it his play with pauses of total firmness, which was led to the culmination moments taking the spectator's breath away. That is very interesting that Sofia Jablonska also tried to represent culture as body interaction, as um, emotions, as a psychological experience. When reading her text, I also remembered a very famous one written by Greek uh, ancient Greek author Sappho. The title of this text is Finitai Moi. And this text describes a body condition and psychological emotional condition of a woman who is experiencing something important for her. So literary scholars still discuss, is it the only description of the situation that person is experiencing, like being together with beloved person, or that is also about some ritual situation. But nevertheless, that is very specific kind of poetical language, which could be described as a pathopoetic, so pathological and pathetic kind of poetic. Pathological in a sense that the whole importance of the situation and the whole importance of the experience as articulated by text is uh, identified uh, through the very specific condition of body. Something different is something it's going to be, something unexpected and unusual is going to be with our body. That's about emotion, but emotion, it's not something abstract. That is something what affect, um, directly affect our body. That is how Yablonska started to develop a new kind of poetic also in Ukrainian literature of that time. And um, as a next step, she also experienced a limitation of language, a limitation of literature as a way of expression. And she also mentioned that she would like to use another one way of expression because literature and word, it's not enough to express the whole experience. Such strength of impression, admiration, surprise, 
has such richness and brightness of colors and forms that I want to take a picture of everything immediately and send it to you instead of writing one word after the other on a paper. That is important to remember this one, this one fragment, this one sentence. Because Yablonska not only wrote and published her text, she also took numerous photos. And when preparing the text to publication, she also supported this text with her own photos. That is also interesting because uh, Yablonska constructs very specific kind of intermediate uh, mediated narrative and her photos not only illustrate her text they are a separate part a separate and completely different way to express something to represent something and in some moments i will be back to this moments a bit later she tried to demonstrate and to articulate by visual pictures something but it's not possible to articulate just using language. So uh, what is also interesting and typical when we start to read Yablonska first travelogue instead of national identification and emotional and effective kind of writing, that is also how she reflects gender vision, different gender vision of the world and different kind of cultural experience. Even if we are talking about the only one national or ethnical tradition, Yablonska also understood that different people who represent, who belong to this tradition, will also experience it in different way and will also articulate this one cultural tradition in different way. His first, uh, her first text is not uh, really long, but some fragments are perfectly balanced. So, uh, one of the most remarkable scenes is a scene when she described how she visited Harem, being invited by the owner of this Harem, the Said. And they discuss different questions, including, for example, a question of marriage, a question about um, gender relation. But she also concludes the whole travelogue with another one scene when she had a conversation with a young Arabic woman, Aisha. And they discuss a very close topic, and she represents two different visions. After she published this one, this one travelogue, uh, one of Ukrainian literary criticists also react and reflect the question of what is female or women writing and how it is represented in Ukrainian literature. Maybe this kind of female creativity is better. She, and so that's about Sofia Blonska, present as a new type of a woman who is not afraid of losing her primordial feminine features, which are at the same time her greatest weakness, softness and dreaminess. She instead acquires something else, courage and an objective mind. This feature, again, the backdrop of her typically feminine sensuality, give an interesting and new effect that still has a peculiar feminine charm. So, if to conclude the first part of my presentation, I hope I still have time to present the second part, and if to conclude my conversation about the first Yablonska travelogue, which also defined the very image Yablonska in Ukrainian literature of that time, I would like to describe this kind of writing and the voice of the second sex from the second world. So I mean that Yablonska identity, for Yablonska it was important that she is a woman and she is a woman who is traveling and writing. And she is benefited and she is limited also by his uh, her gender identification. At the same time, she is also a person who represents so-called second world, even if it's not especially correct. But what I mean here, She's European, she's a person with a white skin, if you want, yes, and she's different. It's not possible to just to avoid this difference when to travel to completely different part of the world. And even if she's really open, she, as I said, she speaks French language and she represents French cultural tradition, yes, just because working for French companies, traveling by French companies, and so on, so on. So she's accepted as a person who represent metropolitan and imperial tradition, but at the same time, she's a person with colonial experience. 
So she represents the second world as colonized, uh, the second world. And in the same time, she represents the colonizer and the colonizer. She's very sensitive. As a result, she's really sensitive to different kinds of national and social discrimination. And in her writing, in the first travel, we could observe different tendencies. From one side, it's a tendency of anti-colonialism. From another side, it's also a kind of romanticization and idealization of colonized groups. These texts are also uh, uh, also include a kind of exotization, and also some stereotypes could be identified. But at the same time, the process of writing is for Yablonska the process of reflecting, and that is very interesting to see how she tried to reflect her own limitation and her own stereotype. She started to use other cultures as a mirror to understand her own personal and collective identity. So uh, that is how she, she started to write, yes? And that is how the first travel of published by Yablonska could be characterized. But as I said, when the book was published in 1932, Yablonska started the second her travel. She decided to go to China. But now I would like to say several words about how Yablonska is connected to Canada, because for sometimes, at least for some months, he was also in a very close relation with another one poet of that time, and that is Alain Grandbois, French language poet from Canada. They met each other in Europe exactly when she started to write her novel in French language. And that was really intensive story, maybe not so long, but really intensive. And Alain Grenbois was ready to marry Sofia Blonska, and that is not just my ideas, yes, and my imagination, uh, because uh, Grenbois also uh, sent several letters to Yablonska, and she answered also her, uh, his letters. She traveled for several times to Europe, and she was ready, as she wrote, yes, to offer everything to Yablonska and to take care about Yablonska. But her answer was that she has a dream, and that is so important for her. And she's not ready to, go, to get married before she will realize her dream. Because if she, uh, she will uh, lead with her dream, she will never have the chance to realize her dream. So that is how she decided to go to China. Uh, before she left France, Alain Grandbois sent a letter to Yavlonska, and he wrote that in two years you would be fully, you will be fully exhausted. Why about uh, why in two years? Because she signed a contract for two years to work as a camera woman from uh, for French documentary company. And Alain Grandbois was not only one person who tried to stop Yablonska before she will leave Europe for China. Volodymyr Venichenko was another one person who also believed that that is not the best idea for Yablonska, and this trip will be really dangerous and really exhausting for her. He also tried to stop Yablonska, and he recommended if it is not possible just to cancel the contract, then try to, for example, to change something in a contract and to be, to be able to return to Europe a bit earlier. But what Yablonska did, she started to travel, and in two years, she, when this one contract uh, uh, yeah, uh, was over, she decided to go to other regions of China, which were not so strongly controlled by French power. That is also a question of what exactly was, uh, uh, what exactly um, it how important it was to Yablonska to travel. What does it mean for her? Uh, was it a fashion? Was it a vocation? Was it maybe a passion? Was it a need for her? Because it was a really important life choice. And her travel to China, it was something different if to compare to her first trip to Morocco.
Uh, she was not following just other people. So yes, some of people, including also Alain Grabois, also traveled to China. So when he did not recommend her to travel for a long time, at least not to travel for a long time to stay and to work in China, uh, he also had his, uh, his own experience. But for Yablonska, it was so important to realize her dream. When she started to travel to China, she also started to write another one text. And what I discovered in her archive, there are two different, uh, two different fragments, uh, handwritten fragments, yes, draft of another one, her work. What we could see here, that is a title, Novi Obriyi, New Horizons. That is very similar to another one title, Distant Horizon, and that is a title of the search travelogue. But this one text, she started to write exactly 1932, because she started also to discuss this text with Lydia Buryachinska, who was an editor, chief in, uh, of editors, in one of West Ukrainian literary magazine, Nova Hata. And uh, there is only one fragment, and that is another one text, and that is another one version of the same story, because at least some fragments, at least some parts of this text could be compared, and we could also discover how Yablonska started to work with text, yes, and what was changed in her text. What is even most, most interesting that this fragment was included, finally was included into her third travelogue. But once again, she started to write this text as a novel, not as travelogue. And that is possible to identify the main character from this text. The name of this character is Olena. She is also a young woman. She is also traveling. So actually, Yablonska tried to articulate her own experience in the form of novel. But finally, she decided to publish this text in the form of travelogue. Uh, what we could discover with her com from her communication, from her uh, correspondence with Lydia Buryachinska, she even finished this text. I wasn't uh, lucky to find the whole version of this text. I'm not sure that the full version exists. But at least what we know from the letter written by Buryachinska, that she had a chance to read the whole text. So she had some ideas how the text could be improved, but as I said, it has never been published in the form of novel. And Sofia Blonska returned it to the form of, of travelogue. But she published The Distant Horizon only in 39, but in 36, she published the second travelogue from the country of rice and opium. And her archive also um, helped us to understand ge the general expectation and the general situation of writing and reading of her text at that time. First of all, what we could discover that is readers' preconceptions. And we could say that Yablonska was double exoticized in Ukrainian literature of that time. So once again, this term is not used by literary critics, literary scholars as for now, but at that time, it was very often, it very often appeared in a publication. Her kind of writing was described as exotic writing, in a sense that she um, described and she articulated something what was considered to be an exotic experience for Ukrainian readers. But the very choice of Yablonska, who decided to write in the form of travelogue, was also exotic for Ukrainian literature. It is rare for Ukrainian women to fill um, us at home on the entire globe. And she was ca characterized as a wandering bird or a bird of paradise. So, we could also describe reader expectation as effective, adventurous writing. So Yablonska was expected to write in such a manner, which was also represented by her first text. Uh, Lydia Buryczynska even wrote, we want to see Yablonska as we know her, who writes vividly and brightly without unnecessary analysis that only leave the reader cold. But what is interesting in the whole context, in the whole 
um, the whole conversation in Ukrainian a literary magazine uh, centered around Yablonska publication. It was also considered that Ukrainian literature, Ukrainian cultural tradition could be defined also as exotic. So exotic was recognized as part of one's own Ukrainian identity. It looks maybe a bit strange, but that is how Ukrainian literature defined itself and its own place within the European context of that time. Literary criticists, inspired by Yablonska writers, writings, started to describe and characterize Ukraine as a bridge connecting East and West. But when Yablonska started to write the second text, he, she found herself in completely different circumstances. That was not just a short trip to Morocco. Just, that was not just a trip for uh, was looking for some new adventures and new impressions. Uh, if traveling to Morocco, Yablonska was looking for a risk and she was fascinated by different risky experience, then her travel to China became a kind of challenge, a permanent challenge. It was about hard work, about, it was about long loneliness, everyday inconvenience, religious prejudice, and also unpredictable traits. And journey became for her also a kind of self-observation. Uh, if the first travelogue is full of different kinds of emotional reaction, then the second one demonstrates the process of self-reflection. And she's also saying in the second travelogue about her own traveling romanticism, which was typical for her uh, Morocco journey. And she, she tried to reflect how her experience, Chinese experience, uh, is different if to compare with her previous traveling experience. What we also could see in this travel look, how the representation of the other is changing. Because at the very beginning of text, she described people in China uh, as a crowd. But step by step, we see how individual characters, individual uh, images also appeared in the text. And we see individuals with names, biographies, and individual voices. What is interesting in this text and how it is organized and why Yablonska was looking especially for such kind of structure to express her own new experience. As the main question in her second travelogue, our discussion a question is discussed a question about beauty, death, and limitation of language. Why the question about beauty, why the question about death is so important for her? Because to answer this question means also to answer a question about the human existence, the very core of human existence, and about different way to organize human life, human existence in different culture. A question of beauty is a question of um, and a question of death is a question of what can fascinate and what can terrify us. And answering this question, we could also say something important about our human nature and also about a difference between different cultural tradition. Uh, to introduce different cultural tradition in her text, Yablonska also create very often different, different kind of the figure of the interlocutor. An interlocutor is a mediator. He is a person, he is a figure who translates different cultural experiences. What I mean saying translate, very often this one person in her text appears as a person who represents um, other, yes, from our point of view. I'm sorry for such for such for such uh, 
construct, but nevertheless, yes, which represent other tradition, which belong to another one tradition, but at the same time, who is familiar with our own tradition. For example, person from China who was educated in France and who can use different kind of, uh, kind of categories and metaphors borrowed both from Chinese and French culture to describe and to represent different cultural experiences. Yablonska very often organized her text in a form of dialogue. And dialogue is understood and is used in her text as a way to stand by one's own convictions without suppressing other voices. Because she is not only fascinated, she is trying to understand different kinds of cultural context, behaviors, and so on, so on. But she is not always ready from the very beginning in one moment just to take completely new position, new for her at least. That is not only about, as I said, not only about traveling, not only about observing for a short time, that is about living for a long time, that is about for, uh, that is about for, uh, about permanent contact. And very often, it's not so easy to decide which position could be or could not be taken by the narrator. And Yablonska started to use a dialogue as a way not only to describe one's own impressions, but also to directly evoke the reader's emotion, especially in a very sophisticated and problem problematic situation. She preferred just to like to please the, her reader. Uh, immediately directly into the situation and not to describe and characterize situation but to like create our circumstances to ask us to challenge us with some questions with some challenges how 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 we uh, on what scale we are ready to understand and also to take um, another one position which is not the same as our on. So when to talk, when to characterize how the whole narrative is organized in this one travelogue, you could say that Yablonska used triangle of literary communication. And who is included into this triangle? That is speaker, author, and reader. So author and speaker, very often they are different features and re they represent different kind of cultural tradition. But what is also interesting in this one book, that is a role of description, because uh, Yablonska also moved from description of dramatic clashes. So that is a situation when we have, we could observe completely different position, completely different interpretation of different situation, life situation, power, political situation, and so on. But she's moving also to the pathos of admiration. And she used not a form of dialogue, but a form of description description and that is for her how she is able to express her own excitement and respect when talking about other culture. She paid a lot of attention and she dedicated a lot of space, textual space to describe the land but not a natural landscape but a space changed by man. Why? Because she respects people who are able to work day by day, year, uh, year by year, hundreds of years by hundreds of years. And she also represents herself not as an observer, but as an expert. And that means that she represents herself also as a person who belongs to culture, who is especially interested and who is especially experienced in agricultural sphere. So that is something she found in common between Chinese and also Ukrainian tradition. Uh, she also described very specific cultural practices, including also smoking opium. But that is not only cultural tradition, but also political speculation for her. When she decided to title her text, like from the country of rice and opium, that is also a kind of marketing, I would say, yet that is how the text could be promoted, because that is something interesting for readers. 
I'm sorry. <laughs> but as for Otto, she's interested in a very deep analysis of the situation. And she described the practice of smoking opium without blame, but also without exotization or justification. She also paid attention that the whole tradition of um, smoking and producing opium is also forced by different international groups who are interested in illegal producing of opium. Uh, when she wrote this one travelogue, when she published this one travelogue, she also published an essay under the title How Opium is Made, How It is Smoked, and How It Kills. And that is a kind of debunking of the Oriental myth. Just a moment, sorry. And now I'm, I, I'm always, uh, I'm very close to my conclusion, but nevertheless, I would like to say something more. Oh, oh yes, I, I muted myself. Um, uh, something more about the very specific experience when Yablonska signalized about limitation of her language. As I said, she tried to describe completely different cultural experience. And in each of such situations, she's asking herself, is she ready to accept this one experience? Is it possible to her or not to, to accept this one experience and how she will change her own identification? When talking about China, Yablonska did not compare just Ukrainian and Chinese or French and Chinese experience. She's looking for, how to say, traditional cultural form in China, which were not influenced by European culture. So that is how she tried to compare to different tradition. She tried to compare traditional culture and modern culture. And she see that they are different. And this difference, it's quite problematic. It's not possible just to keep and recognize the only one tradition. It's not possible just to say that this one tradition is better and this are, is worse. She's really open to different kind of tradition, but sometimes she experiences something what she's not ready to accept. And when to compare the first and the second travelogue, we could pay attention that it, in each of them, we could find a moment that Yablonska is really like speechless. Uh, at the main place of Marrakesh, she described the score of entertainment. And when she wrote about very specific emotional condition, her own condition, about her intensive emotions and about the, this one condition when she described herself as a person who is drunk, that is about her visit to the square of entertainment. And this, in the second travelogue, she's describing completely different something what is happening on the square of execution. And that is a real place in a city she lived at that time. And what she saw traveling, just walking in the city, she saw the person who was sentenced to death, to public death. And it was a kind of torture. And that was also explained by some cultural tradition. And that was a moment she was not able to accept. And she described this moment and this experience in her own text. And what she said, that is the only one experience, the only one situation I cannot to describe, and I'm not able to take photo of this situation. But when she published this text, yes, she also support this text by a photo with this one person and a process of execution. And no explanation in this text why and how she changed her decision. This one publication was only introduced by a short note that please pay attention you could be stressed too much by reading this text so maybe it's better not to read this one yes it's very sensitive but that is a challenge for Yablonska reader not to decide to read or not this one text but to answer a question in what way Yablonska changed her own not opinion yes but in what sense Yablonska found uh, her own 
ability, yes, to take a picture. What happened? What, what influenced her in such a way that after seeing that that is the only moment in her life she was not able to take a picture, she finally did it. That is why her, her tracks are not limited to only verbal level. They also include the visual level of narration. And that is also a level when the reader is challenged. And Yablonska um, ended the second travelogue with a very specific scene. And that was, that was a scene with opium smoking and her own delirium as a story about one's own weakness. So she described a story when she started to smoke opium. She was, she was not especially happy of that, but uh, she has very specific, she very specific dream. She saw herself and she understood that she is um, for herself, yes, she is the only person who is really responsible for her life. And at the same time, she is the only person who is the greatest danger for her own line. This scene could be characterized from the perspective of psychoanalysis and could be described as a representation of life drive and thus drive in the same time. But after this one dream, after this one scene in her travel, Yablonska uh, finalized, Yablonska ended at least three things. First of all, uh, she stopped to smoke opium. After this one delirium, after this one dream, she decided that that, not, uh, that is not her way. And she, do not, she does not need more of such, uh, more experience in such a way. The second thing she also finished it, that is her travel to China, because the whole travelogue is concluded with, with a scene when she decided to go to Europe, to go back to Europe, and she decided not to take opium to Europe. And the third thing, which is also ended and concluded with this one scene, is her travelogue itself. And that is also important. That is not about smoking opium. That is about something what Yablonska discovered about herself. The second part of this dream was also about her childhood. She saw herself as a very young girl. And she has really strong feeling of different smells, of different sounds, as she remembered it from her childhood. That is very interesting and remarkable. As I said, the third travelogue was published just three years later, but she started to write her third travelogue much more earlier. So it's not possible to say that Distant Horizon is the last one text. She finished this text later than her, her travelogue about China, but nevertheless, exactly this one scene could be understood as a final scene of her travel of writing. I mentioned at the very beginning of my presentation that Sofia Blonska also um, decided to write a book about her childhood. From my childhood, exactly this one book could be understood as the fourth and the most important journey of Yablonska. From my childhood could be understood as a book about parenthood and inheritance, because she's uh, saying a lot about her father, about her mother, and about relations between father and mother, and her own relation with her mother, his father, her, uh, her brothers and sisters. That is a book about devotion and one's calling and responsibility to other, about the imperfection of human nature and the power of love, love about courage and fair acceptance and understanding. This one book, it's not like idealistic or utopian one. That is a book telling about the time of the First World War. That is not about her experience, how she traveled to Russia. That is about the first year of her life as she remembered it. But as I said, 
That was also years before and at the beginning of the First World War. That was years of catastrophe. And that was how important for her it was to rediscover and retell this part of her own story. Traveling around the world, she finally said that she was always looking for uh, Paradise Island. But uh, it was not possible to find such place on the earth. But finally, she understood how important it was to communicate with different people, to share some experience with different people, even if not completely uh, glad and uh, happy experiences. So, when to conclude my presentation about Yablonska, I would say that Yablonska performed several transgressions, at least in Ukrainian literature. It's a kind of gender transgression, yes, because she also introduced like, this one kind of writing, women writing, feminine writing, new type of feminine writing into the history of Ukrainian literature. It's also a genre uh, transgression because Trying to write in a form of novel, she finally decided to use completely different form of uh, narration. And that is how she contributed also to anthropological and autobiographical writing in Ukrainian tradition. Uh, his writing could be also characterized as perceptual transgression because she started to develop emotional and affective type of writing media transgression as an attempt to build her narrative, including verbal and also visual level. That was also the kind of cultural transgression. That is also about uh, how she identified herself starting from national level and then moving, switching to another one level, to the discussion about traditionally and modern, uh, or, or traditionally organized culture and culture which is organized as a modern one, as a moving one is a culture which tried to be developed and finally Yablonska also performed a kind of discursive transgression i mean that including of Yablonska travelogue into history of ukrainian liturgy could benefit us a lot because that means that we could pay attention to completely overlooking moments in the literary history, Ukrainian literary history, and to include and also stress different kind of moving experiences in the history of Ukrainian literature. We could, for example, create a version of Ukrainian literary history from Skovoroda to Yablonska and to characterize different kind of moving and how moving and traveling also affected literary writing. But when to talk about not only Ukrainian literary tradition, we could also start that Yablonska is very interesting and the general literary history could be benefited also, including Yablonska writing into the whole tradition of women travel and writing. So as I said, travelogues were quite popular in literary tradition in uh, interwar period. And travelogues are characterized as a text in between two words. But Yablonska wrote being a part of cultural triangle or, or being, being placed in a cultural triangle. At the intersection of the Western as imperial culture, Yablonska represented by working for a French film company, the non-European cultures she described it in her travelogues, and the Ukrainian culture which belongs to the European tradition but remained stateless in the interwar period. When um, uh, Josie Kelly characterized uh, women modernistic writer in such a way, particular for modernist writer, travel provides a new value, a new muse. Travel writers of the early decades of the 20th century re reveal uh, the extent to which travel allows for new conception of the self opportunities for image, uh, image, uh, sorry, imaginative thought and experimentation. Then Yablonska uh, also 
is seen in a bit different position because the starting point of her travel in both a geographical and a symbolic sense was not a com the comfort zone, but instead the turbulent marginal territory of interwar Europe, which problematized rather than establishes cultural and national identification. And the last sentence of my presentation, the writers is, uh, uh, represented is Sofia Jablonska travelogue as a displaced person and liturgy as a variety of experiences in a variety of forms. And that is the last slide of my presentation. I'm very thankful for your attention. It takes maybe a long of uh, a lot of time. Thank you for your attention. And if you have some comments and some questions, I would be um, glad to answer to respond to those questions. Thank you, uh, Professor Haleta for a fascinating talk. I join with all of you with your emojis or otherwise to applaud uh, today's speaker. Thank you for a fascinating talk. It is certainly very, very evident that, that you have fallen on a fascinating topic, that the topic has fascinated you. And I believe that anyone who, who has viewed this uh, lecture with us today or, or who may view it in the future is going to be equally fascinated with Yablonska. And so, you know, among other things, I would say, you, you you have more work ahead of you. You need to hurry up and get as much of this published as possible because there is going to be greater and greater interest in Yablonska, who, who was in some sense fortunately forgotten until now, but you, you won't let her remain that way. And certainly uh, your, your uh, representation of her travel writing in, in this full circle of looking for for the exotic paradise elsewhere and finding it only at, at the end of her writing career by looking back into her own childhood it, it, it certainly represents a, a fascinating way for all of us to look at this i am trying to uh, fill some time here while all of the rest of you put together your questions we are ready to entertain your questions please indicate in one way or another that you wish to ask a question and the floor is open to those who wish to speak. And anyone? Uh, Marco Stack, please unmute. You're muted. You're muted, Marco. Olena, thank you very much. It's excellent to hear that uh, Sofia Yabloinska is getting your attention. I'm, I'm sure that it will be very, very productive. I wanted to ask you just briefly because in the in, in your very interesting presentation, you did not mention anything about her private life in a sense of her human connections. Mm -hmm. I think that it is a very, very important uh, topic because she, to a large extent, is a very feminist figure of her time, um, in, in many ways ahead of many Western fe feminists. Uh, um, yeah, could, you, could you comment maybe a little bit on that? Thank you. Mm -hmm. Can I answer the question and then next one? It, I think let's take one question at a time. Okay, yeah, thank you so much for such a question. So I just mentioned some some moments for her private life, but her private life, I think, is extremely important for understanding her writing. Without this one context, it's not so clear what exactly going on, yes? But I would start not only with her private life, with her relation with different men and women as an adult person, but from her childhood. Uh, 
I said that her father, uh, her father was a very important feature for her, and she was very close with her father. He was really educated man, and he was really clever and honest and so on. But as she realized it as a child, and after that, once again as an adult person, he took a wrong decision when, in sometimes. Yes, he took a wrong decision to deciding to go with Russian army to the east. Yes, and that that has really hard consequences for the whole family. And that was a challenge. That why why the last text written by Yablonska, it's not the utopian one. When she is writing about her childhood, that is like to accept everything, including also some mistakes. That is important. But I think that this time it's about her feministic or not only feministic position. Yes, in some sense, Sofia Yablonska could be defined as a um, feminist uh, figure and also her writing are feministically oriented but i think that is not enough just to say and to describe her as a feminist because that is interesting also to understand what exactly is going about for her that was clearly understood that each person have has to realize her or his own dream and as a woman she was also interested first of all in becoming a personality and after that in establishing and developing relation with other with other uh, with other people she was really afraid that she is not ready to stay in permanent relation before she realized her dream. That is why she decided also to interrupt her relation with Alain Grandbois. But she married, uh, she married another man, uh, French commercials in China, and she married him before she started to travel. But she was uh, uh, sure that it will be not a problem for her to travel. But after she returned, it, she also dedicated herself to family life and that is not only the private one story because it became a part of like a general cultural story in ukrainian liturgy in the second half of 30s when one of ukrainian magazine organized a questionnaire and sent a questionnaire to different ukrainian women writer women who are women who were writers also and ask it about writing about family life and so on so on and sofia Oblonska answered this questionnaire saying that she's also very glad being mother being uh, a wife and dedicated herself to family life and Irena Wilde was a person who reacted very sharp to this one answer. She said, we are doing a lot of different important work, but how it is possible to answer this questionnaire in such a way? And that was a kind of discussion. So for Sofia Blonska, it was important also to balance different, different parts of her life. And now when talking about private things, I have to mention another one, another one part of her, her own family story. Uh, her father was, he, he really was a person with, how to say, who is, who is a calling person. But he decided to dedicate himself not to religion, not to church. He decided to become a doctor. And that was his dream. And he started to study medicine. But he fell in love to Modesta, who became uh, Sofia Yablonska's mother. But when he asked a Modesta father about married Modesta, uh, the answer was that that is the only one way to, uh, to become a priest. Because Yablonska was the only one daughter of Greek Catholic priest. And that was another one choice done by Yablonska's father. He decided to change his career. But it was not so easy because for many, many years, for a long time, he still helped people in different complicated situations and he helped us in different situations in this. Um, yeah, when people were looking for, for medical for medical support. And Yablonska being a very young girl also helped his fa her father in such in in, in, in doing uh, in helping people. And that was also another one um like open question for Yablonska, yes. How to balance these two different parts of the life? 
So relation with other people, uh, how to how to how to um, in the same time connect professional part of his or her life and family one and relation with other people. So for her, it was not so easy to answer such a question, but it was so important for her to find uh, to find such a configuration of her own line to be responsible for her own line. So yes, she was, and she was considered to be a feminist writer, but at the same time, it was not just like following one idea. She was looking for different scenario of her life. And even after, for example, after the Second World War, her husband started to work for one of international uh, company in Hong Kong. And she spent also at least two years in Paris and she managed a hotel in Paris. So she was a person responsible for herself or her, uh, her, her, her children for some time. She was supported by her man. But it was a really complicated situation. So the private life and public life are so uh, strongly and so yeah so strongly connected and to understand the whole text created by Yablonska different travelogues and also the last book we yeah we need also to understand the life context and and uh, the historical context of writing thank you, thank you. Hey, Elena. It's good to see you. Fantastic mm -hmm. to see you. So I'm married to an anthropologist <laughs> and I'll have much mm -hmm. to say to her, I think, this evening. Um, but I'll leave it to the anthropologists in the audience to ask good, a good anthropological question. It does strike me that her experiences are still very much mediated, right, by others, unless she knew Chinese, knew Vietnamese, right? She's still relying on other interlocutors to inform her experience, but if I might, I'm, I would like to ask you a historian question. Um, so uh, I'm still struggling to understand uh, how she had this ambition to never be in exile, and yet, as your last comment suggested, um, critics view her as a displaced person. So she left Ukraine when she was 20, if I understood you correctly. So what what keeps her tied to Ukraine? Uh, what keeps her fascinated uh, about Ukraine and um, uh, and how does she square this fact that she is, as you say, in the employment of uh, a French press agency, uh, sees herself connected to France as a European, but also in a way exiled from, from mm -hmm. Ukraine, making this choice still to write in, in Ukrainian. Um, uh, so that's one question. And then the, the historian question is really the obvious one the way in which audiences, readers in Ukraine were viewing what she was writing. Was it a way for them to uh, escape their particular circumstances uh, under Polish rule in East Galicia? Or um, uh, did they reflect, was it just enjoyment or were they reflecting also uh, upon the things perhaps that she was reflecting about empire and uh, the colonial nature of what she confronted elsewhere around the world and drawing some sort of analogy to their own experience. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you so much about exile and about being displaced at person. When I decided to use this one word in my presentation, I also keep in my mind what was said by Bogdan Rubchak about writer as displaced person. So it's not just displaced person as a person in political sense, political status or social status. Yes, that is also about being like not only attached to one to one place. It's like you need to leave your place. You need to go out of your limitation, even space limitation. Yes, to become a poet, to become a writer. That is like to be inspired to write. Yes, you need you need to be like uh, not only to stay in one place. Yes, you need to be displaced, like mood person. That is also a vision of, um, uh, of a writer, which is a modernistic one. Yes, not only be rooted, but also to have your own road. Without road, you do not have your own plot. You do not have what to say individually. Yes, because if you are rooted, yes, you are rooted in some kind of tradition, but you not do not only represent this one tradition. You have, you need to have your own personal individual experiences. That is also modernistic 
artistic vision of writing. About being exiled, why for Sofia Blonska it was so uh, she decided to travel and she described this one, this one idea and this one need, her own need, as um, a way to avoid being exiled. Because if you are uh, you, you can take your own decision, yes, that is your own decision. That is your choice also, yes, you can do it. Th this choice in different ways. And she decided that maybe that is a way not to be forced, but somebody else. So not to be an object of violence and, and organize her life in such a way. But yes, before the first, the Second World War, she had a chance for several times to visit also Western Ukraine, visit her family. And what uh, this situation that was one situation and in time of the second world war yes it was completely different experience she had never returned to western ukraine after the second world war and she had this idea she had this idea and she thought about visiting western ukraine but she was not invited also by other people and she was afraid of such a trip and that was a kind of even not being being exiled but not to be allowed to go back to ukraine but ukraine was was very important for Sofia Yablonska. You know, uh, in one of my pre previous presentation, I also mentioned the fact that when um, Claude Levi Strauss traveled to South America and he returned to Paris, he also compiled a collection of different um, of different um, artifacts, and he decided to present this one collection to Museum of the Human. Uh, I'm not sure or, uh, how. How it calls in, in in English? Yes, that is one of the anthropological museum, the, maybe the main one in Paris. At the same time, Sofia Yablonska, after visiting, uh, uh, after leaving in China, she returned after her around the world trip. She returned to Galicia, and she had a presentation in Lviv in Antisha Ukrainian Scientific Society, and she also decided to present collection of different Chinese artifacts to Ukrainian museum but what i discovered that after the second world war she also decided to present a collection of ukrainian artifacts including uh, ukrainian pesanka and other things to the same museum in paris anthropological museum because for her it was important to represent ukrainian tradition in different contexts also on the level of this one museum and not to lose this one tradition so for her it was very strong connection so for her, it was important to identify herself as Ukrainian, but it doesn't mean that at the same time she was not able to identify herself as European person, as modern person, as vast person who represent Western culture, but maybe not on the Western culture. Yes, because she felt herself that, yes, I'm representing Western culture, but I have my very specific Ukrainian experience, which allowed me to establish, to develop my contacts with non European cultures in completely different way, because I can share some other experiences as being colonized, represented, suppressed, um, dominated communities. And that is all something that is also reflected in her text. Yes, it was partly reflected by uh, literary criticism, but as I said, uh, her writing, especially the first travelogue, was so uh, unexpected for Ukrainian literature at that time that many readers, they were looking especially for this adventurous experience and they were expecting something like that from Sofia uh, Yablonska. But what is interesting for me that the main expectation, that was expectation for a novel. And Irena Vilda wrote that we are expecting something like a novel about Chinese life. And she compared Sofia Yablonska to Pearl Buck, who received Nobel Prize in 38, but who was known in Ukraine at least two years earlier, and who was translated to Ukraine, some fragments, because before that she also received Pulitzer Prize, and uh, Irina, Irina Wilde said that, yes, we are expecting for this great Ukrainian novel. And in this sense, I think that 
Ukrainian reading community and also literary criticists, they were not ready to understand how important it, that is, not only to work in a form of novel, because some experience could be represented in must more, uh, must better or more telling way in also in, in another form. So the form of travelogue, I think we are benefited as readers by this one form. I'm not sure how it would be happen this novel. I had a chance to read these fragments, and my opinion is that travelogue is really much more interesting. Thank you. I think there's time for one more question, if there is one. Any, any takers for one more question? If not, then allow me to thank it. Taras, do you, you wish to ask a question? Just a very quick question about genre of mm -hmm. uh, these travelogues, because um, it's you, you clearly um, place them in a kind of fluid um, place between novelistic, between travel genres. Um, could you comment a little bit more about it? Because it's really, it, is it really a travelogue? Uh, travelogues usually give you contexts or introduce history or geography. None of it can be found in um, Yablonska. Uh, it's not mm -hmm. a trip that uh, readers could simply retrace after her steps following the same itinerary. It's not. It's more itinerary of personal interactions, encounters, fascinations with peoples, uh, people that, that she met on her trips. Um, so where would you place the genre? Really, mm -hmm. it's it's somewhere in between, and it's very. Mm -hmm. uh, each of these vignettes is very short. It's almost like a little video clip, like a mm -hmm. like a TikTok, if if you were to compare it to anything. Uh, each of these uh, little vignettes that um, uh, together create uh, something like Char Maroka is is literally two pages max. So, um, how does it fit into the uh, development of genres? Mm -hmm. uh, of the time and within Ukrainian context as well, because it's 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 quite mm -hmm. unique, I would say. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Yes, I think that is a very interesting question, not the formal one about genre and how it was defined. And that is interesting that it was defined completely differently at that time. Uh, by authors and in case of Yablonska, also by literary criticists who re act to this writings and I collected more than 20 different genre definition which have been used to define this text. Uh, first of all, I would say that I would not limit myself as defining travelogue only as a text which introduce history and geography, what is observed. I think that especially at the beginning of the 20th century, this inner journey and representing different kind of emotion and expression, that is also important. That is something what is happening with travelogue. That is something that is uh, happening also in the sphere of journalistic, I mean reportages at that time. And very often it is centered on a person. What is also interesting to remember what's going on in uh, women writing, in feminine or feministic writing, that is also about reflecting personal experience and what happened what is happening during the 20th century also in anthropological writing we could observe how the very manner of writing is changed because starting from the 80s so that's completely a different period but it took time in anthropology also different texts appeared like Marjorie Shaw's stock publication and other which represent other culture but in a very unexpected way for example um, describing and articulating the researcher's own experience, like emotional experience. And I think that theoretically such publication and such approach was inspired by Clifford Geertz once again, who said that that is the most important and things that is after publication of Malinovsky um, diary, that is after rereading of Claude Levi Strauss and so on. So I'm not so sure that travel could be defined all only as a 
texts which introduce some kind of historical and geographical information. But I have to say that the manner of writing in case of Yablonska also have changed for, for, for the, the whole time she has worked as a writer. Because I, if the first travelogue is fully like emotional text, an effective one, then the second one is much more reflective and she described different phenomena, she tried to explain something. And when she started to write The Distant Horizon, she did a lot, she collected a lot of publications, she has a lot of notes with different kind of information about cultural tradition, political system, gender relation, and so on and so on. And she even... Uh, um, um, for example, she had some American publication. She was looking for publication in different language, and she tried to collect different kind of information to understand much more deeply what she is talking about. Yes, so I think that that is not possible just to characterize this genre as a stable one in Yablonska, uh, in Yablonska case. She started to write being very, very young person, being also like egocentric person. But that is something what is maybe different, unexpected, untypical, but also very interesting in her writing. And I'm very sorry, the second part of your question, it was about... You're muted, Taras. Yeah. So it was about travelogue and the second part of your question, maybe well, I missed... Travelogue and, and, and novel, because ah, uh, yeah. the, the text is neither, uh -huh. and it doesn't, um, it doesn't even have a... a transparent uh, temporal demarcation the way most travelogues have like times uh, or um the the range how many weeks it took or how many days mm -hmm. it's it's quite it's basically a, a landscape of her emotions and interactions with with humans in Morocco as opposed to and, and I'm not saying that every travelogue has to be uh historical or geographic but mm -hmm. most of them have at least something historical and geographic for their readers, but it's certainly not mm -hmm. what she wanted to do in her mm -hmm. work. That is why, uh, as for me, the first one, Travelogue, is very interesting, but not the most representative in case of Yablonska. If you would like to understand how she was developing this genre, the first one, it's exactly like a um, collection of fragments, very emotional. It's like, you know, you just have for just a blush, yes? And you see some situation, even maybe not a situation, but uh, how, how the person who is observing is impressed by different situation and fragments of reality and that is why i said that the second one is organized in a completely different way and she is looking for another forms of narratives and some of researchers who dedicated her, uh, their research to sofia blanska travel they paid attention to this change but it was not analyzed yes because if we are only focused on emotional type of writing then the first travel is really interesting but the second one is completely different for me it was important also to analyze this uh, very long description, how she described agricultural, for example, tradition in China and why it is so important for her. Nothing like that in the first travelogue. Almost nothing about everyday life of Morocco. That is also important. Yes, that is a kind of exotization. She is reacting on something that is really um, not strange, but atypical. Yes, and she's impressed just about emotion, the first emotion. But the second travelogue is completely different also because she has spent a lot of time, years in China, yes? And that is why she's also asking herself and she is also addressing the Chinese culture, some other question. And that, that is, in this sense, it is different, yes. And that is also, I would say, a struggle for writing because she was not educated as writer, yes, and she was looking for a way how to describe other culture. And she was also, as I said, in the second travelogue, she also reflected this one, traveling romanticism in her first travelogue. And that was not enough for her, even for, for herself, uh, when she, she started to describe China and other countries. I can only thank you from the bottom of my heart for such a wonderful lecture that has evoked 
so much interest and and so much enthusiasm from uh, all of our participants i'm sorry we we don't have more time but i think that is th this has gone on long enough to indicate that we would never finish if we didn't force it to finish at some point and so i will take the opportunity to applaud your wonderful presentation thank you and thank all the participants for your uh, presence here today. Thank the uh, organizers of the Struk Memorial Fund, particularly the family of the late Danilo Struk, and invite you all to follow our activities. And the, the video of this session will appear online uh, probably sometime later this weekend as I get through editing it. And please look forward to our further Struk Memorial Lectures next year. Thank you very much to one and all. Thank you, thank you for, so much for inviting me and thank you for your question, for your comments. And I think that uh, we have a lot to discuss about Sofia Jablonska, not in this time, yes, but uh, I hope that we will discover a lot reading her travelogues, not only travelogues, and also discovering a lot of from her personal archives. Thank you once again.